Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. There's a lot going on in the church world and in the secular world these days. Christians are concerned about a number of things, like who do we vote for in the coming election? What is our environmental responsibility to take care of Mother Earth? And what is all the fuss about legalizing marijuana? Well, Life Questions attempts to confront these and other serious questions that you, our viewers, send us to answer. And so this week, we have invited a panel of ministers to research your questions and bring solutions from a biblical perspective. Today, we're joined by a distinguished panel that I'd like to introduce you to. First, we have Pastor Michael <clears throat> Wyckoff of the Joy Harvest Fellowship in Lima. Secondly, Darwin Dunton, who is pastor of the Mount Tabor Church of God in Salina. Next, we have Pastor Dave Burkhardt of Westminster United Methodist Church. <clears throat> and rounding up our panel for today is Nathan Branham of the Grace Fellowship Church in uh, Lima, Ohio. Happy to have you all with us today. Now, let's continue with um, what we, where we left off last week. We were talking about suffering. Suffering for Jesus was one of the questions that came in. And Pastor Wyckoff, I, I appreciate the way you were so careful in making a distinction about suffering for Jesus mm -hmm. versus suffering in general. General, give us a little recap of that before we go further. Well, I think uh, we were saying that there was a, um, some confusion in the church about suffering. And um, uh, I like the a distinction that I heard one day, somebody speaking about Jesus and how he suffered, okay? And there's a difference between his example in suffering and his substitution in suffering. He was our substitute in suffering on the cross for our sickness, but he was our example in suffering on the cross for persecution. And I think it's important because some people think, well, I'm sick for Jesus. You know, God gave me this illness or, you know, God took, you know, my youngest daughter and so forth. And, but, you know, the, the first Peter chapter two, which I won't read like I did last time, but basically it talked about his example. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. And if you look at those things, committed no sin, no deceit found in his mouth, being reviled, didn't revile in return, when suffering, he no threats, and trusting himself. In other words, that's persecution. You know, mm -hmm. they, they unjustly crucified him. But then in the very next breath, we have the famous healing scripture, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, you were healed. And we see that that's a physical healing because in, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 53, where the Hebrew words don't mean griefs and sorrows, but it actually means pain and suffering of illness. And also in Matthew, when Jesus was healing people, they quoted that same verse, you know, he took our infirmities and carried our sicknesses. So a lot of people are taking sickness and calling that suffering for Jesus, which it really is not. He was our substitute, he took it for you. But on the other hand, he promised us suffering for persecution. Okay. And that's what Paul suffered and he uh, talked about that at length. All right, any other one follow up on that? It was mentioned uh, last week about how um, Paul suffered because of the, the people that he was so concerned about. And mm -hmm. I, I never really um, experienced that until uh, finally giving my life to Christ and, and becoming a pastor. And, and then you really begin to worry about, or I did anyway, began to worry about the folks in the church. And uh, you worry about salvation of your loved ones and your mm -hmm. friends and, and even your enemies cause, um, because hell is real and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. nobody would ever want anyone to go there. And so, so we do suffer in that, in that realm as well. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think when, uh, <clears throat> going back to Jesus a little bit, as our society continues to digress and move away from the church and move away from Christ, we're going to see more and more of this. And uh, you know, Proverbs 29, 27 says, an unjust man is detestable to the righteous. And the one whose way is upright is detestable to the wicked. Mm -hmm. And I think as we continue to hold strong and say, this is what Christ wants, this is what we are to do, and everything else. We're supposed to maintain this for Christ. Uh, the society is gonna to continue to call this even more and more detestable, which it has. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. how many times has the church been called all these names, all these, you know, you're racist, homophobe, bigoted, and everything else, and you know we're not, but we hold to a standard that the world hates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of that, 
You can expect lawsuits. You can expect people to lose their jobs for standing up for righteousness. It's going to happen, and it is happening. So persecution has arrived, is what you're saying. Not the way I ever expected it, but yeah, it has. Um, you know, we're not going to have people storming into our churches and with AK-47s. But as far as economic persecution, as far as uh, I mean, people, a man just was a week or two ago, a week or two ago lost his job because he wrote an article. He said there's two genders, and he lost his job as a result of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I never thought in 34 years of ministry this is how it would start, mm -hmm. but this is how it's going. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's just going to progress. It's going to get worse and worse. And don't discount that AK-47 is coming into the church oh, yeah. either. They're We're here. seeing it they're happen here. even today. Yeah. Yeah. They're here. So, yeah. But now I'm, I'm referring to that as the government because well, we used to yeah. do that in the 80s and everything else. Uh, yeah, and we saw that in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, definitely. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, having exhausted that subject, I'd like to go on to the next topic that we'd like to talk about. And <clears throat> last year, a well-known pastor announced that he was no longer... A Christian. He was pastor of a, of a mega church. And um, the person that wrote this question said that they had followed this man through the media. And I guess they had been um, a follower in the, in the deepest sense. Now they're a bit discouraged about Christianity because they're saying, you know, how can this guy who pronounced himself to be such a great Christian now turn away? And the writer of the letters to us said that this person appears to be happier now that they have abandoned Christianity than they were when they were professing it. And now they're beginning to be concerned about their own personal beliefs as a result. So what do you make of that? In the, around August or September of last year, there was a number of Christian celebrities, pastors who were struggling with the faith and renouncing the faith. Uh, I believe she was, this person is talking about Joshua Harris, the uh, author of the uh, book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And then eventually he became a pastor in a mega church. And uh, then he, um, <clears throat> he left the church, left his wife, um, marched in a gay pride parade up in Canada. I even just showed everybody a picture of him with a, with a rainbow donut that he was eating, surrounded by his friends. And so I, I see two things here. Why is it happening? And number two is uh, her dilemma. The, I'll just talk about dilemma real quickly. You're following a man, not Jesus. And if you're going to follow a man, you're going to be very, very disappointed. Secondly is, um, why is this happening? I think two, two reasons. One is, is that uh, for so many years, the church has enjoyed, uh, looked favor upon in the United States and everything else. Now it's not. And I think that's a struggle. And even as a pastor, sometimes I struggle with, you know, I used to be liked by everyone. And now I'm not. What, what's happening here? You know, this, mm -hmm. and, and so it's a little bit of a, a course correction that even I had to go through, okay? The second reason, there's something there. Mm -hmm. There's something there, and I want to say, uh, sin or something that has not come out yet that I think will come out that he has struggled with for so many years, and all of a sudden he says, I'm done. I'm done fighting the battle. And, and then he, he, I, 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 there's something there. I, when a pastor falls I, or, or leaves, I go, what's there? Mm -hmm. There's something there that we don't know. <clears throat> that has been there for a while. Been there for a while that he has struggled with and, and put under the rug or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've got my ideas, but it's just my idea. Any other ideas on that uh, concerning that letter that we got? Um, well, one of the things that really bothers me in here, it says that uh, it seems like he's always happy. Mm -hmm. um, he's happier since making this announcement. And, and I think really what he's experienced is probably a false happiness. Um, I know uh, before I became a Christian, I would tell you that I was happy. And, and I had a lot of joy in life. Um, but, but I can also tell you that I was filled with uh, struggles and trials. And, and they, were, they were deep inside and, and not often came to the surface. Um, I thought I was happy anyhow. Uh, until I really, truly uh, discovered a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then I found out what true happiness and true joy in life is. Um, and it's something that, that the cares of the world 
or the the promises of the world just can't fulfill. Mm -hmm. Just can't fulfill. Pastor, have you had anything to say so far? Uh, I, I would just say on that note that there's always a honeymoon period in any kind of mm -hmm. you know decision that you know maybe has been a long time mm -hmm. coming. So. It'll, it'll wear off very quickly. He'll see that uh, this, this was a big mistake. Um, you have to forgive me for being vague on this next point, and that is, uh, I believe it was one of Billy Graham's associates in, in their earlier days, uh, defected from the faith, which uh, people that apostatize, it's happened from the days of Paul, Philippians 3.18, Paul says, you know, many now that walked with us are now enemies of the cross of Christ. But one of uh, Billy Graham's uh, fellow pastors defected from the faith and, uh, ran into all kinds of issues and was about ready to die and uh, had, a, had a deathbed confession of something like, I, I really miss Jesus. Mm. I really miss Jesus. And so I, I agree with Pastor Dave that true joy comes from knowing Jesus and, and sad enough about Joshua Harris, he may be experiencing what may be happiness now, mm -hmm. but he's going to soon see that there's no substance to it and that <laughs> real true joy is found in Jesus. Amen. Well, just, and I'll be brief here mm -hmm. on this. Um, a pastor being brief. No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what a concept, huh? The lady that asked the question. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about her just for a quick second. Sure. You know, and I don't know if she's listening or whatever, but, you know, I, I think the, her wording was, um, you know, now I find myself questioning what I've always believed about God is really true. What can you tell me to convince me that God is real? And so you're looking at a, at a like you said, you know, uh, you know, Darwin, that, that you can't look at a man, you have to look at Jesus. And Jesus is the one you seek, you know, and, and uh, basically in so many words, Jesus says, if you seek me, you will find me. You know, if you're concentrating on somebody that fell, and Jesus said, people are going to leave the faith, they just are, okay? Um, but, you know, he rewards those who diligently seek him. Jesus is not going to barge into your life. He's going to influence you. His spirit will convict you, you know, and, and woo you, mm -hmm. but it's up to you. Do you want him or not? And if you really want him, then seek him and you will find him. And, mm -hmm. and then you will have your answer that God is real. Absolutely. Very good. Very well put. I'd like to turn our attention to another subject, uh, but we're going to take a break now. When we come back, I'd like to talk about the complaint that somebody has. When trying to take her loved one to church, she says there are just too many hypocrites in church. And so therefore, she's discouraged from going. How do, we, how do we deal with something like that? Stay with us. We'll be right back to discuss that right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, let me uh, read you this next question. Pretty interesting. Tell me, listen to this. My sister-in-law says she won't go to church because she has met too many Christian hypocrites. And what can I say to her to convince her to give church another chance? Give the church another chance. How, how is she going to go about convincing her sister-in-law? You're, You're all smiling, but nobody wants <laughs> to look, jump in. Because we've all heard this. <laughs> we've all heard this, okay. Yeah. Filled with hypocrites. Okay, well, we, I, I, yeah. one more, come on, we can use you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you can, um, there's different reasons, I think. Um, I think one of them is when you really, it, I'm just going to go on my experience. There mm -hmm. can be other, other reasons, good and bad, but these are people that are looking for an excuse not to turn their life over to the Lord. And, um, you know, the question that I would ask, I said, well, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? I mean, that's what I think her sister, sister needs to ask, you yeah, know, needs to ask the person, you know, where, where are you with the Lord? Turn the discussion away from church and move it toward the person and where they are with, with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, well, yeah, I, I accepted the Lord, but I, they had an experience where somebody in the church and, you know, church, let's face it, you know, church can be a pretty 
horrible place for certain people that have certain experiences with people, right? You have people in church. And, and I can see how people have said, you know what, I'm done. I'm, I'm not in the church anymore. But, but I think you have to start with the spiritual first and, and see where they are with the Lord and get them back to a good relationship with Christ. And once they have that relationship with Christ restored, which I don't know if you can do in one conversation, you can plant someone and can, you know, reap later. But once I think you solve their, their relationship with the Lord problem, the church is a byproduct. You're either not going to go because you really have an issue with the Lord or you're going to go because you're good with the Lord. You with the Lord. Lord's good with you. Mm -hmm. How are you with the Lord? Very good. I, I think there's a, uh, a huge misunderstanding, uh, especially in the secular world, about what a true Christian is because uh, mm -hmm. I think so many times yeah. um, people who are are unchurched or even dechurched have this sort of idea that Christians have to be perfect. And, um, you know, there was only one that was ever perfect and they crucified him. So um, Christians are not perfect. Um, we Just sin, forgiven. we fall. Um, and and so, so we have to have some understanding there too. Um, and not only are we forgiven, but we have to learn to forgive as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. We do have to learn to forgive, so. Any other quick comments on that? No, about covers it. And Rock covers it? Okay, all right. Let's, uh, let's go to the next question then. Um, <clears throat> it says here, what does the word unity mean to you as a pastor? It seems that there are many pastors who don't want to work with others. And that is confusing to me, she says, or he says. So if the pastor's preaching unity, but the pastor himself or herself won't join in unity with other pastors, it, it's kind of conflicting with your, with the message. <laughs> You're smiling. <laughs> well, I've noticed this even within our own denomination now when we get together uh, uh, in different settings and, and I don't understand what it all is. I think it's, it's a lot of, of humanness within us, mm -hmm. um, maybe jealousy within the, the ranks of the church. Is it, is it uh, territorial sometimes? Or? Could be, could be. Um, you know, I'm a United Methodist pastor and they move us around quite a bit. Sure and, do. And I, I think it's the, the whole idea that we don't want to see somebody do better than we did at that church. And, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of a struggle, but, um, but I love working with other pastors. Uh, I love helping to prepare them to go out and do ministry. Um, we've got two now that have gone out from our church that are going to be pastoring other churches. And nice. I'm excited That's for awesome. it, looking for ways to help them. And, but, um, but I do think we've become you know, territorial or, you know, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but there are a lot of pastors that don't want to work together. And not only that, um, you know, I think that there's theological issues within it too, especially mm -hmm. across denominational lines. And so. Across denominational lines, yeah, we, within denominational yeah, lines. In, <laughs> yeah, sure, certainly. Yeah. Uh, any, any other comments on that? August, uh, I like what uh, Augustine of Hippo said. It says, in essentials, unity, in not essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Hmm, okay, I disagree with you on some things, and I disagree. <laughs> I, I'm a post tribro We already talked about that. <laughs> you guys can all be wrong, and I still love you. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> and we appreciate your grace. <laughs> but, <laughs> but who is Jesus? <clears throat> Period. That's, yeah. that's essential. The resurrection, that's essential. But as far as being post-trib, mid-trib, pan-trib, you guys can be wrong. It's okay. Okay. So There are pastors in this town that are getting together all the time. That you don't hear about, yeah. I mean, yeah. right? We were at a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah Revive Ohio came through uh, back in uh, 2017 now, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a long time already. And uh, they just brought a great unity. I, I was able to meet pastors and ministers that I never would have had the chance to meet before. And um, they, they just emphasized Jesus, His cross, salvation by grace. And so I think a lot of times uh, people draw their, their faith, their doctrinal circle so tight that you know, hardly anyone can get into it. Uh, or, and or I think uh, Pastor Dave really hit the nail on the head is many pastors are just insecure in their call. Mm -hmm. And so they are territorial. And so, well, don't, don't go fellowship with them or I don't want to lose a sheep. 
uh, they, they haven't yet been able to rely and rest upon the truth that Jesus said he would build his church. And I don't need to steal sheep. I don't need to lure sheep. Jesus is going to bring to my church those that need to be there and those that he wants to be there. So there's, there's a ton of issues, but I think at the end of the day, I think we, we've got to err on the side of love, generally speaking. Here's another question that I'd like you to, to take a look at and tackle this one. Uh, this a viewer says, I want to talk with my adult children about Christ. They don't really want to listen to me. How can I start that process without sounding preachy? <laughs> I have five kids and uh, my middle child, he and I are, are that way. I have to try not to sound preachy. Yeah, for, for me, it's, it's our oldest one. Um, he, he lives in Omaha, Nebraska, great kid. Uh, well, he's not a kid anymore, he's a man, but uh, uh, has, has gone a lot of different ways with his faith. And, and um, one of the ways that we have been able to reach out to him and, and um, just show him the love of Christ is um, we pray at our meals when we go. And, and he's open to that. Um, we've talked to his children, uh, shared Bible stories. Uh, I can remember doing chalk drawings on the sidewalk and explaining um, different Bible stories to them. And, and you know, it's, I guess it's just through that love that we share with them that we're able to, to make inroads into their life. Um, you really have to have that. I mean, if you get really pushy, uh, it tends to drive people away. And so, so if you can find those subtle ways to, to reach in and, and let them know you love them and that you want to be reunited with them someday in heaven, that's a deeply heartfelt thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think that's critical that you let them know that that's a, a heavy concern. Sure, sure. That we suffer for Christ because we want to know that you're there. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, I, in my church and I have... Um, grandparents and parents of, of adult kids and, and little kids. And um, yeah, it's, it's a big barrier. You know, they're, they're adult children. Just, they, they've given up talking to their adult kids. And um, I have, my, we have, my wife and I uh, parented six adult kids now, you know. And by the way, you never stop being a parent. That's true. And uh, you know, you don't, at one, point in time in their life, they're going to be responsible for their own direction, mm -hmm. okay? But you do have some authority and influence, but I think the first thing to do is show love if you have opportunity. Um, take it, obviously, but you know, you don't have opportunity to do it anymore. I, Mom, don't talk to me anymore. I don't yeah. want to hear, I don't want to yeah. hear about it. Let's just be family. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you uh, do what Jesus said, and I think it's in Luke 10, 12, pray for laborers somebody they will listen to somebody yeah. it's up yeah. to you to pray yeah. for them you know i don't think there's any prayer in the bible that says okay pray for the salvation i think paul did for the you know the jewish people in general he wanted them saved but but really pray that a laborer will come to them that's okay. number one and then number two show love because i had kids you know a couple three of them strayed from the lord but they came back okay and and i don't I, I, obviously I prayed. You, you do take a little bit of authority in your prayer time, not with them, but against the, the strongholds sure, sure, and the sure. demonic influences and the thoughts that they have and the things that they listen to and the arguments and the, you know, the, the, the arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge yeah. of Christ. You have authority to, to bring them down and, and that's the obstacle. So um, I, that, that, would, that would be my advice. Excellent. Speaking of authority. And love. Love them, by yeah, the way. Because okay. they always say, Dad, back when I was rebellious, you loved me yeah. and you listened to me. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. That had as much to do with my coming to the Lord as anything else. So okay. anyway. On another subject, um, speaking of demonic activity and the like, 11 states have legalized <laughs> marijuana and another 14, 15 or so have decriminalized it. So you've got about Oh, just over half the country mm -hmm. where there's no consequences for marijuana. Nation seems to think that it's nature's way of saying hi. So <laughs> how, how do you deal with that? Right. <coughs> I'm going to say how, how high. Yeah, how high. <laughs> how do I deal with it? Yes. Uh, I was the chaplain of the Hancock County Jail for 12 years. And 
I could literally walk into the jail cell and see the age and guess the age of when they started smoking that stuff. Because for some reason, as I observed, the brain stops functioning. It stops maturing. When they start? When they, when they started uh, smoking, taking drugs and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so for me to stand up and say, well, God created it, therefore it's good, da 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 <sighs> All things God created for good, but how man uses it may not be good. Yeah. And the, the, the marijuana uh, lobby used social media and everything else to say how good it is, this yeah. is the benefits, it's going to stop seizures, it's going to stop nausea, it's going to stop all this stuff. And, you know, it's the wonder drug. It, it's the snake oil of mm -hmm. what we had in the 1800s. Why would government allow the legalization of a drug knowing all well, knowing what it's going to do to your brain? Because they're tired of fighting it. That and I think there's a, a lot of dollars involved in it too. Yeah. An awful lot of dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. I do a Bible study with the ladies at the Worst Center, and uh, for almost all of them, that's where it got started. Uh, it ended usually with heroin, but it almost always started yeah. with marijuana. Well, it's a gateway, it's a gateway drug, isn't drug. it? It's and a gateway drug. Yep. It's leading into heroin and cocaine. And that's like. what do you say? You know, I have a <clears throat> sister in law who had um, concussion. Nothing helped until medically. She started using, using it. So what do we say to that? You know, I mean, I, I, you know, that that's a question that I'm wrestling with. You know, mm. and I think it's like a gun. You know, you know, a gun can be positive the, or negative. What's the what? What do I say to the, them? The key word you said was medically. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's just like any drug. Right. <clears throat> exactly. If you if you take it out of, and they've extracted the chemicals out right. of that, so it's okay. there. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna have to. Good. Leave it at that. I, I perhaps I'm a bit unfair bringing that question up so <laughs> late into the program. Uh, and we can take that up another time. But thank you very much for your input. And we certainly appreciate you being here this week and, and last week. And hopefully it will be quite enlightening to our viewing audience. And we thank you for tuning in. And we'll ask that you tune in again next week at the same time. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you for now. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.